live from Utrecht. This is the fan with George Nedo. Hello. Welcome, George. Thank you. Good to you're, be back. You're back. You're not in quarantine anymore. I escaped. <laughs> you escaped. Good. So, yeah, welcome back. We're going to discuss X-Pops today. X-Pops, yes. Did apparently, you hear the drama? Apparently, that's a hot topic. Exactly. I, I hear this drama. I have no idea what the drama is about. I'll do my best to, to reconstruct what I think the drama is about. Yeah, without... I'm not sure what the drama is about either, but I think I have a faint idea. I, we'll, I, get to, we'll get to that later. No, we can get to it now. Oh, we get to it now. Yeah, okay. I think my theory is that for some reason people were talking about x pubs and then Peter McCormack got really upset and said, I don't know what x pubs are, but I'm proud of it. Yes. And then, of course, all the Bitcoiners said, oh my God, Peter McCormack does not know what an x pub is. And they all started, you know, explaining it to him and... Yeah, so that's why we're talking about it. It's like the classic cycle, where where Peter McCormack says something slightly controversial about how everyone's being too too nerdy about Bitcoin, and everyone gets mad at him because he's not a real Bitcoiner. So then he gets his controversy for his show, and then all the Bitcoiners get their virtual signaling for being a hardcore Bitcoiner, and everyone's happy. Well, and if you want a virtual signal properly, you should listen to this podcast. But I think even I think that's not where it started. I think okay. But again, I only have a sort of faint idea of where the drama came from. But I think it started with Samurai Wallet posting this article about how Wasabi Wallet had some sort of weakness, okay. which was I think very overblown. As far as I was able to tell, it seemed like a very overblown concern. They were making a lot of noise about it, which seemed you know the the problem was actually. Pretty small, as far as I could tell. Mm-hmm. While Samurai themselves, they have this XPOP thing where if you're not using a full note, then you're sending your XPOP to Samurai, so that's actually very bad for privacy, which we'll get into. Right. Plus, if you're mixing with other users on, on Samurai who have their XPOP, then that is, a de- that is detrimental to the anonymity set. I think that... Uh, so it's kind of these things where, you know, if you live in a glass house, don't throw stones... Yes, I believe that's a, a samurai developer once said that. Oh, he said that? Well, like years ago in a different drama. Okay, well, I think that's sort of what's going on here, where Sa- samurai said something about wasabi, and then people started to criticize samurai themselves for some of the weaknesses they mm. have. And I guess that's maybe where Peter McCormack came out and said, I don't know what next pub is, and... That how well, I don't know if he actually said that. I'm making that part up. So I'm not even. I'm not sure about the first part either. So we're we're just spitballing here. But this is probably yeah. this is like a, how a classical Bitcoin Bitcoin drama story would unfold, isn't it? Exactly. <laughs> this is a very stereotypical. Uh, so this like may it. well have been how it happened. All right. So maybe we should uh, then explain what an X pop is. Yes. So let's get to the X pop. X pops. Well, so a long, long time ago, my dear grandchildren, when you were all, you know. Anyway. You had this wallet before it was called Bitcoin Core, but the the original Bitcoin wallet. And what it would do is it would give you private keys. And because people already quickly realized that address use is a bad idea, it creates a new private key every time you receive coins or every time you send change back to yourself. And in order to make that new address, you need to make a new private key. And those private keys are perfectly random, or they should be perfectly random. Uh, Problem then is, how do you back up your coins? And the idea was that the first time you start Bitcoin... You get about 100, maybe it was a different number, keys, and you print those out or save them on some, you know, Arctic vault, whatever, and you move on with your life. But then, once your 100 keys are all used up, the wallet will just create 100 more keys. And if you forget to back those up, and it's not like the wallet will warn you, uh, <laughs> right? You're, you are toast. Your, yeah, your you change don't have will a go. for your keys. Correct. Your change will go to the key number one hundred and one, and if you, if you then like have a boating accident or something, you, you're out of luck. Yeah, your your computer crashes and then you don't have a backup. Yeah. So quite. That, but by the way, this isn't even that long ago, I think, right? Because you started explaining this like it's it's prehistory. But isn't it like just a couple of Bitcoin Core versions ago that seeds were introduced? Well, Bitcoin. I don't think Bitcoin Core is the first thing to introduce seeds it's probably quite sure, late, no, late I, to the party I'm sure it's not but yeah. bitcoin core was pretty recent when the, that was not very long ago when i, I think it was seed, 2016 it? or something since that it started using deterministically derived keys it's been only a few years yeah yeah but i think there was a standard proposed to do this in 2013 
So the standard's been around a bit longer. Right. Okay. Which is yeah. called BIP32. Yeah, yeah. And the idea there is that you create a single master key from which you derive all the other keys deterministically. So that if you know the master key, you know all the individual keys. And to the outside world, well, all these addresses the will look key, you random. You can generate all of the individual keys. Correct. Right. Yeah. And to the outside world, you just see random looking addresses. But to you, um, they're all connected. So let's get into that in a little bit more detail. So first of all, the master key, that's a random number. Yes. That's that's really all it is in the end, right? Yes. And then from that random... Because that's all a private key ever is. Exactly. It's a random number. And from that random number, you can generate a yeah. seemingly random number, which is the public key, which is actually mathematically linked. But right. the math only works one way. It's a one-way function. Yeah, and so the idea is you start with a random number and then you hash the random number mm -hmm. and you assume that the hash produces another random number. And or uh, at least yeah. it would, should look random. Yeah, it's like you should not be able to predict the original number from it and you should not get collisions. So there should be... If you start with a 256-bit number, that means there are 2 to the power of 256 possible numbers. You hope that if you run those through a hash function, the result will also be 2 to the power of 256 different numbers. Yeah. And not, for right. example, with some of the earlier SHA functions or MD5 or whatever, where you might have two different numbers that would produce the same end result and that kind of stuff. Yeah. But assuming that's all correct, you basically, yeah, you start with a single random number and then you b generate a whole bunch of private keys for your wallet. Which is great. Okay, so let's see. We start with this random number, the master key. Mm -hmm. What do you derive from the master key at first? Oh, you basically, you can put these numbers in a tree. So without bar bothering people with the exact math, if only because I don't know the exact math, you create a child key at one level or multiple child keys at a level. So you can have a tree of, with branches where you might want to divide your coins into accounts or, or other things. Yeah, and, and just to be clear for Peter, if he's listening, we're not talking about actual trees. We're, we're talking about we're generating numbers from other numbers. Correct. And that's what we call the branches. The, the numbers we've just generated from a different number, that's what we call a branch, right? Yeah. And from this branch, if you want, you can generate another yet another number, and that's always. Yeah, and there's a somewhat of a standard way to do that. So, for example, most Bitcoin wallets, when you create an address that's not SegWit, you would start with the master key, then you do derivation number 44 hardened, and we'll get into what hardened means. Then you do derivation number 0 hardened, which says this is Bitcoin, and then you do derivation number 0 hardened, which is your first account, because we count from 0, of course, and then... You do another derivation zero that says this is a receive address, and, another, and then you do derivation zero, or one, or two, or three, or four, or five, or six, or seven, depending on which address you're, you're about to use. So that's kind of what it looks like. And wallets all do this automatically. And if every wallet does it the same way, then you can actually import into a different wallet. Now, let's say you are not using your own node, and you want to look up your balance. Now you have a problem, because to the server... You have to ask it, hey, this is my address, what's my balance? And you could give it a list of a thousand addresses uh, that could get quite slow. And so what you instead would do is, is send this thing called the XPUB. The XPUB. Yes. And so the XPUB is a master public key, not a master private key, mm -hmm. uh, at a certain part of the tree. It'll give you all the addresses below that part of the tree. Now, this tree is hanging upside down, to, to be <laughs> clear. So that's, that's what trees do in uh, technical literature. So, for example... We'll, we'll add an we'll article with a couple of pictures in the show notes, because yeah. pictures really do help when, when trying to understand this. Yeah, but basically, if, if you say you have an account, uh, some sort of separation of funds, then you would give the server the XPUB for that account... So the server can then see all the addresses for that account, but not addresses for your different account or even for your different shit coins that you may have on the same tree somewhere else in a tree. Yeah. And so I'm I'm a wallet. I'm a wallet right mm -hmm. now. Okay. And you're you're the server. Yeah. Um, I don't have the full blockchain. Yeah. And I want to know how many funds I have, how many bitcoins I have. 
I could send you a bunch of addresses that I know I have because I have my, you know, I can generate them and I know I have my seed so I can generate all my addresses. And, I, you know, for example, we'll get to this in a bit, but I'll mm -hmm. send you my first 20 addresses. Yeah. And then I ask you, sure, uh, how many Bitcoins do I actually have? Can you please check the blockchain for me? Yeah. I could do that. Or I could send you my XPUB and that way you can generate my 20 addresses. Plus, way more. You can uh, generate as many as you want. Yeah. And then you tell me how many you have. So that's sort of two different ways of doing it. So yeah. some wallets share their XPUBs. Exactly. And if you want to go a little bit more into detail there, the XPUB is what you do is you derive change address, uh, sorry, receive addresses from it and change addresses because your wallet might have change and stuff. Sure. And then, and so the change, the receive chain is child number zero of the XPUB, and the change chain is child number one of the XPUB. Sure. And then every address is child number zero, one, et cetera, of that. And so typically, yeah, you, you the server would generate all these addresses. But of course, the problem here is, okay, let's say I'm sending the server one XPUB every 0.1 seconds, and the server has to derive all these addresses. That gets pretty painful. So maybe you don't want the server to derive a million addresses. So then the question is, what what's a reasonable limit? And a wise man or woman in 2013 said, let's make that 20. So, so to be clear, we're now getting sort of into, into the problems with XPUBs? Yes. Yes, okay. So dear listener, Why we're now getting, into the bad. <laughs> now getting into the problems. So Shurs was just saying yes. So you, you want to, I'm asking you how many, how, how many funds do I have? So I send you my XPUB. I'm the wallet still. Yeah. And then you're... Generating, how many are you generating? I'm gonna look at the first 20 addresses of that XPUB, and then the rule is if I don't find anything, I'm gonna stop looking. Yeah, you're just gonna assume you don't have any funds. Yeah, or you're gonna assume, I should say, I don't have any funds. Exactly, but if I do find something, I'll keep looking basically until there's a gap of 20. That's called the gap limit, right? And, and I'm assuming that when you say you don't find anything, it doesn't just mean if there's any funds in the address now, it just means if there's funds now or ever. Or ever, been. exactly. Yeah. Because the way most block explorers do this is they have an index of every known Bitcoin address. Mm -hmm. Sorry, Luke Dasher. And the transactions that ever went to that address. So I just generate all these addresses and I see if they're in my database and if they're in my database then I just keep looking and looking and looking until I don't find anything in my database anymore. Yeah, so as a standard, this is some sort of protocol standard. This is just a way, you know, someone came up with this and this became sort of a, what are you called? Well, it's a wallet standard, a I wallet guess. A wallet standard, yeah. right. But it's not a consensus rule. Yeah, sorry, that's what I meant. It's not like a yeah. consensus rule, but it's become like a wallet standard. So you're you're looking for the first gap of 20 addresses that have been completely unused, and from then on, you're going to assume, okay, that's how far you got with this address is. Yeah, because what, what you were assuming here, that the way people use it, is they create an address, they send it to a friend, they receive some coins, and yeah. then they do it again, but maybe sometimes their friend doesn't pay. Right. Right, that scenario, it makes sense to have this 20 limit. Yeah. The problem is, now you're running a web shop, uh, let's say a BTC pay server, mm -hmm. and this server generates an invoice every time the user goes to the checkout. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people just abandon the checkout. And so... Yeah, they get to the checkout, they figure out, wait, this is actually too expensive, or wait, I don't actually have enough Bitcoin in my wallet, or... Yeah, and another... Or maybe they're just, you know, fucking with the web shop. That's also possible. Yes, or and spying on the web shop. environment. Yeah, or spying on the web shop. Oh, they, yeah, They might sure. want to know all the addresses. Right, right. And in the case of BTC Pay Server, there was a specific thing where it also supports Lightning, but it's going to make an on-chain address even if you use Lightning, which means that for every Lightning payment, there's also an address being generated, which is not used. And so that, that gap of 20 is reached pretty quickly. Right. So then 20 people in a row use Lightning or for some other reason don't yep. make a payment. BTC Pay server, that's what we're talking about here, yep. right? Yeah. So mm -hmm. they ask some server how many Bitcoins are in my addresses. The server checks these 20 addresses in a row that haven't been used. And then they assume, okay, well, that's how far the wallet has been used. So every payment that came after it just doesn't show up and BTC Pay Server or whoever. Well, uses BTC it. Pay Server will be fine, but if you let's say you're using BTC Pay Server with a hardware wallet and you then want to see with your normal hardware wallet software what is actually on the wallet, your normal hardware wallet software might not show it, mm. depending on if they actually honor the gap. 
Right, right, right. Uh, right. Which they might not, because a lot of wallets will actually scan a bit more than that. But I mean, remember, this is an easy problem to solve. This isn't it, even really a problem with XPUB. This is a problem with the wallet standard that someone came up with at some point. Oh, well, yeah, it's nothing to do with XPUB specifically, but yeah. it is a problem with deterministic key derivation that you have this, this trade off between a DOS vector and good privacy. Because you could just use the same address all the time, that's bad for privacy. Or you could generate a new address all the time, but now somebody needs to track that, and that can get out of hand if sure. somebody is attacking you. Still, this seems like a minor problem to me. I can assure I w- you from having worked on wallets that it's a major headache. <laughs> okay. But on the, in the scheme of things for Bitcoin, I'm sure it's a minor problem. Like right. If you're the one needing to deal with the problem, it's not a minor problem. Exactly. Because also, the other thing is maybe a hardware wallet that's really smart, like a hardware wallet that can actually parse transactions or a blockchain. It needs to go through that, and it might be very slow with derivations. So there's some limits there, at least because I think I once casually proposed to people to increase the gap limit. Some people who worked on hardware wallets are like, don't even think about it. Right. The next problem seems, or I already mentioned it, but Mm -hmm. that seems like a much bigger problem to me, that you've given up your entire privacy Yeah. if you're using a wallet with an XPOP. If you're doing it that way, I mean, obviously you should run a full note and do everything yourself. Mm -hmm. But if you're using a remote server to check your balance, then... Yeah, it's not good for your privacy if you just give them the XPUB because they can see all your transactions and worse than that. All your transactions ever. Yeah, and in the future. Yes. So if, if your tax authorities ask you for your XPUB, you are screwed because yeah. now the tax authorities can just watch you forever in real time. Un- unless you, of course, change the wallet. Yeah. So that's not good. I think some hardware wallets and some software wallets still do this. Others might have gotten a little bit better by actually sending individual addresses. But this is tedious, too, because let's say you're a wallet and you only send the last 10 addresses to the server. Well, what if somebody sent you money to the first address? So now you occasionally still have to check the first address. Mm-hmm. Or the user logs in and says, oh, my God, the money never arrived. And then there has to be some refresh button or something that sends all the previous addresses. So make that UX work is, is tedious. Yeah, It's no problem if you run your own node. But the whole point for these XPUB is kind of to make it easy to communicate with the server. Yeah. All right, so we have the gap limit problem, privacy problem. Are there any other problems? Well, not, well, yes. I think we'll get to that. But maybe we can talk about this original seed again, this this master key. Uh, because there is this really okay, nice... This is not really a problem with XPOP. No. You just want to talk about the seed. Yeah. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the seed. I mean, we don't have to talk about XPOP all the time. So <laughs> That's the... what the episode is about, though, Shorts. Well, we'll get to that. Okay, go on. So, basically, this... You start with the master key, and the master key could be written down as a a hexadecimal number, uh, but it's kind of difficult to remember and difficult to write down. I think most people don't like writing hex. And so there's a standard called BIP39, which changes it into a word. A nice doge or dogi version of that, of of such a phrase, could be uh, much surprised, very convinced, guard, change, write, radio, network, leader, etc., etc. To be clear, this is an actual... This is something you could actually use. There's a doggy version of seed. Yes, I suggest not using it. It suggests not using it, but it is possible. It's, it's yeah. possible, yeah. Yeah, because there's a set of 4,000 words, roughly, and you know, if you take 12 or 24 of those, you get 128 to 256 bits of randomness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, so to be clear, we started out saying that the master key is just a random number basically yeah and what you're explaining here is that you can convert this random number into a series of words yeah exactly you can't you start with a series of words and you convert it into that random it's number. it's kind of the other way around yeah, yeah you're right um but that's fine so that's what people tend to write down those 12 to 24 words mm. are the the start of the master mm. seed which then eventually leads to this xpop once you get to a specific uh sub part of the tree yep that's all good and fun there are some problems with the choice of words. It's one of those standards that was developed before people were using it. Mm-hmm. And generally when you do that, it just people then actually start implementing it into wallets and thinking about it a little bit more and are like, eh, actually this kind of sucks. Mm-hmm. So for example, some of the words are too similar. Other words have too many the same starting letters. So if you're typing on a on a tiny little hardware wallet, trying to type in the words, usually just ask you for the first couple of letters. But right. the, the word list was not chosen smart for that, so you often need quite a few letters, even though that could have been done could better. Be optimized. There's some other problems with making make it hard um, to translate. But I think there are some very specific Bitcoin words in there, which 
some people have objected to because it sort of gives away that it's a Bitcoin wallet. I, I can assure you, if you type 12 or 24 words in any online place that hits any server, there will They're be some malware on that server that will that will interpret it as a Bitcoin seed and will take all your coins within seconds. Sure. If not sure. now, then by the time you need your seed, it will be the case. Yeah, that's, that's probably, so, well, still, you know, there's a burglar in your home and then there's 12 words and then if one of the words is Satoshi, then that might increase the chances that well, it's going to yeah, get into a wallet somewhere. There are some police manuals floating online that basically say, hey, look for 12 to 24 words in somebody's flower pot. And you know, if you have that, give it to this guy and he'll take all the Bitcoin. Right. Yeah, that's that's well known. I don't think you can fix that unless you also randomize the number of words into something other obscure. But then, of course, the trade-off is if you die, then nobody knows what the hell to do. So it's that's tricky. Anyway, so yeah, you think the standard the standards could have been optimized? Yeah, that's now, some, I will say. But it's not a big though, enough problem that people want to revamp everything for it. Plus, I think it would be a bad idea to revamp everything for us. Like, as long as it works well enough, I would say let's keep it because it's good if people can keep using their seeds into the future. Oh you know, well, if, if wallets yeah. update their software all the time to you to use different seeds, then people are going to lose their money because they can't remember which software they used. And which I mean, the way you would upgrade this is by making it so that software can tell whether it's an old style or a new Make style it backwards phase. compatible. Or, uh, I well, guess, not backwards I compatible, but the opposite. So basically, there would always be a word in the new seed that is not valid in the old seed. So old software just won't even recognize it. No, but I won't. Oh, wait, old software wouldn't recognize it? So if you, if you were to come up with a new standard, yeah. you would... Put a word in that standard yes. that is not part of the old standard. Yeah, yeah, but I'm thinking about the opposite thing. Like in 10 years from now, you someone's going to be able get to... their seed from cold storage. Yeah. And they download a wallet. They want to be able to insert that of seed, course. even yeah. though the wallet now uses a new type of seed. Yeah, so you would have to have all the modern wa- wallet software would have to support the old standard, at least as an import. Yes. So and I guess if you be... don't have a new standard, that's more likely to be the case. So they need to be backwards compatible. Yes. The software needs to be backwards compatible, but the standard doesn't. Yes, okay. I, yeah, good point. So another thing sort of related to this about standardization is that these 12 to 24 words, I think, is mostly the same for every wallet, the way that works. But there are derivations. So how do you go from the root of the tree, the master key, to each of the addresses in your wallet? And unfortunately, several wallets do that in different ways. Right. In a headache-causing way. So if you find those 12 words... And you think you've got somebody's Bitcoin. Well, you maybe you do, maybe you don't, but they could be anywhere in that tree. So there's a site called walletrecovery.org. Walletsrecovery.org, sorry. Uh, to send you to a phishing site if you type that wrong. Walletsrecovery.org, yes. And that has a list of old and new wallets and how they actually go from the, the secret or the mnemonic to each individual address. And it just tells you that it's a bit of a headache. Which is an incredibly long list. Yeah. But a lot of them do sort of use the same thing now that I'm actually looking at the list a little bit closer. It's not like they're all doing something different. Yeah, I mean, there's basically for the old style addresses, you know, usually starts with zero. It's it's 44 slash zero slash star for the yeah. accounts. And for SegWit wrapped, it's 49. And for uh, native SegWit, it's 84. Once you get the multi-sig, your headache might increase. Like how to derive a multi-sig wallet with two different seeds and, and the different sure. wallets on what sequence and stuff. Yeah, that's painful. So basically, when you back up a wallet, you better also back up how how the derivations work. So you may want to not just write down your mnemonic, but maybe some hints about what wallet software you were using. Yeah. Depending on who's the audience for that information, of course. Okay. Is that XPOPs? I think so. I think we've we've uncovered the mystery. We've, we've addressed <laughs> yes, the drama. Yes, sure. We have uh, we have de-escalated the conflict. <laughs> That's what we're here for. I think we're good. All yeah. right. Anything else you need to cover? No, I don't think so. How long have we been recording now? 25 minutes. Long enough. Long enough. All right. Thank you for listening to the Van Weirdem Shorts NATO. There you go. 